Good morning. Our scripture reading this morning is taken from Matthew chapter 14, verses 1 to 12, which can be found on page 15 in the New Testament portion of your Pew Bible. Reading from Matthew chapter 14, beginning at verse 1. Hear what the Spirit says to the church. At that time, Herod the ruler heard reports about Jesus, and he said to his servants, This is John the Baptist. He has been raised from the dead, and for this reason, these powers are at work in him. For Herod had arrested John, bound him, and put him in prison on account of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife because John had been telling him, it is not lawful for you to have her. Though Herod wanted to put him to death, he feared the crowd, because they regarded him as a prophet. But when Herod's birthday came, the daughter of Herodias danced before the company, and she pleased Herod so much that he promised on oath to grant her whatever she might ask. Prompted by her mother, she said, Give me the head of John the Baptist here on a platter. The king was grieved, yet out of regard for his oaths and for the guests, he commanded it to be given. He sent and had John beheaded in the prison. The head was brought on a platter and given to the girl, who brought it to her mother. His disciples came and took the body and buried it. Then they went and told Jesus. This is the word of the Lord. Cheery passage this morning. In 1937, Walt Disney Pictures put out their first movie. When I saw Audrey was reading the scripture, I figured I had to find a way to mention Disney at some point or in some some way. But Walt Disney made a choice at the end of his film to uh, include one of the most famous lines in all of fairy tale storytelling. You all know how the, the, the movie ends. And they all live, say it with me, Happily ever after. It's a strange way to end a movie. Because the happy times don't just roll on. In fact, that was a choice that Disney consciously made to borrow a phrase that was popular in fairy tale literature. But it wasn't popularized in that form. The original, the first time that that phrase ever turns up, it was in, a, it was in, the, in, in the ancient book called The Thousand and One Arabian Nights. And the phrase, as it's put there, is, and they all lived happily ever after until the one comes who destroys all happiness. Less cheery ending to a story. But cliches weren't always cliches, and cliches become cliché for a reason. What Disney was accidentally or, or intentionally tapping into was a cultural paradigm shift that was taking place. America and and the Western world was undergoing the longest stretch of of unbridled prosperity that it had ever experienced. There was more wealth, more privilege, more joy, more peace being, uh, being experienced than they ever thought possible. And even though it was about to be interrupted by the outbreak of the Second World War, the cultural myth at the time seemed to be that things, that the good times would just keep on rolling. When I, when I say it's a myth, I don't mean it's a story that's untrue. I mean it's a story that we draw meaning from. It's a meaning-making story. Myths don't draw their power from being true. Myths draw their power from becoming true. It's a powerful story. It's a powerful idea to think about that this, that this idea of happily ever after became so ingrained in our culture that it's become a cliché that we often think that in the church we feel a depression or an anxiety or we feel a loss if the good times just don't seem to keep on rolling. But the strange thing about it is that we find that more often than not, and when we read and when when we engage with the biblical narrative, that the happily ever after just doesn't seem to pan out. John certainly doesn't get a happily ever after. 
There is no great ending for John. There is no 11th hour rescue. There is just simply a story of John imprisoned for doing the right thing, for doing the right thing at the right time, and John seems to pay the penalty for it. A little bit of background. John had been preaching and preaching as most zealots did and most uh, Essenes did that there was a that there was a very high moral bar that all Christians uh, that all all uh, God God fearers as they were called then were obligated to to meet. Especially high for the, was the bar for the kings and for the leadership, and so it was the responsibility of prophets to stand in place for God. That's literally what the word prophet means. It means to stand, to become the spokesperson for it. And so the prophets like John were called to speak for, on God's behalf, speak truth to power, to speak to the powerful and to say to them, the way you're living is, is creating a system that is untenable, that is unattainable, and that is unfair to so many people. That there are pe- men and women who are called to live in this world a higher standard because they are examples, they are role models for the rest of us. And you, King Herod, you are called to live the way that God has ordained you to live. Herod, on the other hand, was much more interested in dating and marrying and sleeping with his sister. And so Herod chose to do that instead. But John kept preaching. John kept declaring that, that God had a different way for Herod to live. And so John, Herod deciding to, decided to use his power the way that great men, and I don't mean great in the moral sense, I mean great in the magnitude sense, always have. He decided, I'm going to shut this guy up because I don't want him to hear. It would be easier for me to change what I hear than easier for me to change how I live. So he has John arrested, thrown into prison, where he figures that the end of the story has been told. But there are people out there who've begun to pick up John's message, namely this Jesus of Nazareth, who began to to wander the countryside, and John's message is still continuing to spread, and and Herod is still hearing, maybe you're not called to live that way. Maybe there is a higher standard that you are called to. Maybe when God said, be holy as I am holy, he meant it. And so John, so Herod's sister Herodias decides that what we really need is what is for this whole thing to just cut off this head of the snake. What we really need to, to silence this whole conversation is just to stop it at its source. So she has her daughter go and dance before Herod. Herod, in a fit of lust, promises to give the daughter and, her, and consequently her mother whatever her heart desires. And she immediately asks for the head of John the Baptist on a platter. Herod has no choice but to acquiesce. It's a strange, brutal, graphic, grotesque story in the middle of a gospel that is all about declaring that Jesus is this new prophet coming to the people of God. That Jesus is this new messenger bringing a, 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 bringing a kingdom of David back to the world. And so there's a, there's a juxtaposition here. The kingdom of the world, the kingdom the way the world sees it, and the kingdom the way God envisions it playing out. As I was reading through this passage this week, trying to prepare for this, I had to ask myself, what was I thinking picking this story to preach on? Because the good news doesn't seem evident in it. It's not, it doesn't at least jump off the page. And so as I was lamenting about this to Dolly in the office on Tuesday, she decided she would go in and take a look at it. And she came back and said, I think it's a really easy story to preach. So I asked Dolly to come up here and preach, and she said no. (laughs) (laughs) But... Dolly said to me, this is a story that sounds exactly like the way our world works. A story of a powerful man with unchecked power using the the trappings of his office, using his authority to satisfy his base impulse. 
we often go to and look and go to scripture and dig through scripture looking for ways that the, the to, to understand our world in a different way sometimes scripture speaks to us and says this is the world the way it is unfiltered unvarnished unadulterated this is the world this morning scripture passage i think gives us a picture of the world exactly the way it is and it's not that we come to, to this trying to redeem redeem Herod, and we don't come to this trying to find a great ending for John the Baptist. We simply come and say, this is the world the way it is. Scripture has this unbelievable ability to speak and to speak truth into every single age and stage of our life and to declare to us again and again and again that like the writer of Ecclesiastes says, there is nothing new under the sun. We live in a world that is not interested in our holiness. We live in a world that is not interested or invested in our sanctity. And we live in a world that is only ever involved or passionate about making sure that its wants and needs and desires are taken care of. Someone once wrote that for a long time the church and the world we're, we're living together. We're living under the same roof. And one night, the world and the church went to bed together. And the world woke up and realized that it no longer needed the church to continue being the world. When will the church wake up and realize that it no longer needs the world to continue being the church? The question that I came to this text with was, is the church guaranteed a happy ending. So one of the, one of the feedbacks, one of the pieces of feedback that I've gotten as I've been preaching and, and thinking about the life of John the Baptist and how it inter- interacts and intersects with our role and responsibility as to be a people in preparation for the God's next stage, is the church guaranteed a happy ending? I think that the answer is no for three reasons, and I think that those three reasons are actually good news. I think that the answer is no, because sometimes God starts something new before the old has completely passed away. You see this, in, especially in the Old Testament, with the story of David, the anointing of David, who is called to be king while Saul is still king. Sometimes God starts something new before the old thing has ended. And this doesn't mean that God isn't faithful It means that God is bigger. Sometimes the answer, uh, the church isn't guaranteed a happy ending because sometimes the answer to prayer is simply no. We see this all the time in Scripture as well. Jesus prays in the Garden of Gethsemane, Lord, let this cup be taken from me. And the answer is no. But that doesn't mean that God doesn't care. It means that God is bigger. And I think the third reason that the church isn't guaranteed a happy ending is because sometimes the grave just has to stay closed. I mean, we forget that there's a gap between Good Friday and Easter Sunday. There didn't have to be a gap, but there was. For that, for what would have been a long 72-ish hours, depending on how you want to count it, there's a period of time where there is no good news. There is no hope. There is no happy ending. There is no empty tomb. There is just the cross looming large in the, in the, in the, on the horizon. But that's because death is actually half of the good news. We are called as a church to abandon our addiction to certainty, to, to, live, to live lives in the here and now. And sometimes that means getting dirty. Sometimes that means standing in the muck and saying, I don't know how this ends. I don't know where this comes from. I don't know if there's good news here. Sometimes it means reading, with, reading the psalmist's words and saying, blessed is the one who's, who dashes the babies against the rocks. That's scripture. Sometimes it means... <laughs> Reading, the t- reading a text like the Rape of Tamar and saying, that's scripture. Sometimes it means reading stories like the beheading of John the Baptist who did nothing wrong to anybody and who did, nothing, who did the right thing for the right reasons at the wrong time and saying, that's scripture. 
Death is half of the good news of Christianity. It is half of our story. It is half of our declaration to the world. And at the end of the day, the only thing that that reminds me is that God is bigger. Bigger than our our fears, bigger than our doubts, bigger than our inadequacy, bigger than our failures, bigger than our death, bigger than bigness. This passage is a call to, to view God bigger. Whatever circumstances you find yourself facing today or this week or this month or this year, whatever struggles we find ourselves coming up against, we have an obligation to say that these struggles are real, that they do not simply get a happy ending, and to live in that space and to say that in that space, God is bigger is what is exemplified by real faith. That's why the Apostle Paul could write to the church in Rome and say, whether we live or whether we die, we are the Lord's. Or by... The challenge of the church in the 21st century, the challenge that we wait and watch for, is a challenge to break our addiction to radical certainty, to to replace it with a faith that is bigger than the grave, to replace it with trust in a God who is bigger than any one of our circumstances because that is the only way that the church can possibly hope to become something greater than it's ever been before. This is the only way that the church can reach for the glory that we possess within us. This is the only way that the church can be anything more than a collection of frail human beings. Lean into your weakness. Lean into your doubt. Abandon your certainty and find in that space the good news to become more than you are. Thanks be to God. Amen.